Chapter Four of Night of Molokai by Eva K. Betts. Chapter Four Joseph Becomes Damien. In January, eighteen fifty nine, the Congregation of the Sacred Hearts had a new candidate for choir brother. Tall, strong, attractive Joseph Savuster has secured his parents' consent to enter. It was a great disappointment to him not to be accepted as a student for the priesthood, but he was four years behind in his education and knew no Latin at all. Much as he longed to be ordained a priest, he realized why it seemed out of the question. Too much was lacking in his background studies. However, as choir brother, he would work in the chapel or the infirmary, or might help in the business office. All of these duties appealed to him, and above all, he was consecrating his life and strength to God's service. That was what he wanted most. In February, he took the habit and the name by which he would now be known. As Brother Damien, he flung himself into religious life with the same enthusiasm which had always marked his efforts. Heavy labor was not new to him, and his heart was gay as his great muscles bulged on the tasks set for him. He was precise and neat and fast, but he was also hot-tempered. Try as he might to hold his temper in check, it would time and again get the better of him. Then he would speak very sharply, often not considering what he said, or to whom. As a schoolboy he had been accustomed to settling matters with his fists. As a brother, he knew, of course, that that was not possible. The restrictions that he laid on his temper made it even harder to keep under control. But whenever he did let go, the end of the storm left him deeply distressed. I must, I must learn to hold my tongue, to be master of myself, he would say to his brother remorsefully. At last he hit upon a plan that he was sure would help him win the battle. He went busily to work in the classroom, and when the other students arrived, he was sitting happily in his place with an immovable reminder in front of him. The words, silence, recollection, prayer, were directly before his eyes, carved into the wood of his desk. The reprimand he received for this gave him a good opportunity to practice humility and self-control. The other novices used to call him that good, big Damien, and all of them were fond of him. His helpfulness and high spirits were as inexhaustible as was his determination to do whatever he was called on to do, as well as he possibly could. He studied furiously and prayed tirelessly, and whenever he and his brother August, Pamphile and Religion, were together, he would get the older boy to teach him Latin, for Damien had not given up hope that some day he would reach the priesthood after all. His spiritual aspirations didn't interfere with his physical exertions whenever these were needed. Both strength and courage were put to the test when a chapel was being remodeled near the Louvain house of the congregation. Every free moment he had was spent helping on the project. One day a problem arose. Near the old chapel stood a chimney, dangerously high, dangerously shaky because both the bricks and the mortar between them had become crumbly from age and the action of the weather. The chimney obviously must come down. But how, exactly, was the raising to be accomplished? Dynamite or any other method of collapsing the chimney was ruled out because whatever way the tall stack fell, it would damage some building. Yet it was so insecure that there could be no question of climbing it. It must come down before the workmen can proceed with their work on the chapel, said the superior. I agree, father, said the boss mason, but I will not risk the lives of my workers by trying to tear it down, nor will I risk the safety of your buildings by trying to knock it down. The two men stood silent, staring at the chimney and pondering the problem it presented. They were interrupted in their thoughts by various workmen who came along to suggest methods for someone else to try. Little groups formed around the ground, chattering, gesticulating, explaining. Many various schemes were worked out, but no one seemed ready to put any of them into operation. Suddenly, Brother Damien left the crowd to reappear shortly with a long ladder. Silently, he scaled the wall of the now almost dismantled chapel and perched himself in a seemingly impossible position on the steep skeleton roof. Slowly, carefully, he balanced himself, stretched his long, powerful arms to the chimney, and began removing the bricks. A murmur ran through the watching crowd. Amazed, fearful, admiring, they watched the good big Damien, as brick by brick he tore down the dangerous chimney. 
Gradually, the tottering structure shrank to a height which the workmen could reach with ease. Then Damien returned to the ground with the contented sense of a job well done. A sigh of relief went up from the watchers, and a spontaneous cheer from the workmen. A little embarrassed, the seminary student had dared to do a job they had shied away from. Probably the only person in the crowd in no way surprised was Pamphile. He knew his little brother, knew his tenacity of purpose, his disregard of self. He remembered that from early childhood Damien had been ready to take on any necessary job, no matter what obstacle lay in the way of its execution. Difficulties to Damien were a challenge to be met and conquered. Pamphile smiled as he thought of the same brick-by-brick -brick method Damien had used in tearing down the chimney was being followed by him in building a road toward the priesthood. At first Damien had learned from his brother simple Latin greetings and the names of ordinary objects. Then he had learned phrases and how to construct a sentence. Pleased, though not surprised, for young Joseph de Wooster had always been a conscientious student. Pamphile had taken his courage in both hands and gone to the superior with a report of Damien's progress in Latin. The good superior was moved by the force of a vocation that impelled the big choir brother to take on so much extra study in a day already filled. He called the young man to him. So, you are determined on the priesthood. Damien flushed and cast his eyes down. I feel I am called, he answered. I want it more than anything in the world. There was silence for a moment, and Damien wondered if he had been presumptuous. Half-finished thoughts flashed through his mind. He was not worthy to be a priest, but the superior knew best the work for which he, Damien, was fitted, so you may join the Latin class, on trial. Damien could hardly believe that he had heard the wonderful words. This might, this just might, be the first step on the path he longed to follow. In six months he was doing difficult translations from early Latin writers. His eyes, from constant overuse, began to give him trouble that would always be with him but he felt that was a very small price to pay for the joy of being part of a class that studied for the priesthood. In June 1860, twenty months after his probationary work had begun, he went to the novitiate at Issy, outside Paris, to spend there the last months of his preparation. In October he was sent to the mother house on Rue Picpus, Paris, where he made his vows. Latin, Greek, philosophy, Big Damien threw himself into his studies, with the same vigor young Joseph de Wooster had brought to his games. Plotting determinedly through the assignments, he acted as if he were unaware of the difficulties which were before him. The year 1860 had been a dramatic one in world history. Both bad things and good were stirring mankind. In Syria there had been a dreadful massacre of Christians. Japan, making real contact for the first time with the Western world, sent an embassy to the United States. The war between Spain and Morocco ended. In Italy, Garibaldi, who had seized control of the government, resigned and permitted King Victor Emmanuel to take the throne. In France, Napoleon III, although he was emperor, was allowing freedoms that usually are permitted only in a democracy. None of these things, however, occupied Damien's mind. He had found the realest world of all, the world of God. And other things, even important ones, made little impression on him. There was so much he wanted to do for God, and so little time, so the strong young man felt, in which to do it. The Vincennes wood, through which the seminarians had been in the habit of walking each Wednesday, now was invaded by worldlings and lost its enchantment for him. Before this, Damien wrote to his parents, one could be quiet and enjoy the pleasures of a walk. Now we see nothing at every turn but gentlemen and ladies, riders and carriages, which are a great distraction and annoyance. Distractions were annoying to Damien, now, perhaps, more than ever, for his mind had fastened on a new desire. He wanted to go to the South Seas as a missioner. The first missionaries to the islands had been sent by the Holy See in 1825. Twenty-eight years later, 1853, the entire archipelago of Oceana was entrusted to the Congregation of the Sacred Hearts. Now, in 1860, Bishop de Pano Yassin of Tahiti had returned to France after thirteen years in the islands to prepare and publish a Tahitian dictionary, a task subsidized by the French government. While engaged in the work, the bishop stayed at the mother house, where he related many things about his life and experiences in his faraway diocese. He had no more interested listener than Damien. 
coral islands, palm trees with leaves whispering in the breeze, sea winds rippling and hissing through the long grasses, high cliffs with ocean spume at their feet, and their heads seemingly cloud-capped. The enchanting land was made doubly desirable by the fact that it held thousands of souls who had not yet heard the word of God. With all his heart, Damien wanted to go there. He wrote to his brother Pamphil, recounting all he had heard of Oceana. He told of its climate, of its natural beauties. He described the natives, a gentle people who had lived happily in the tranquil part of the world until the white man came bringing disease of soul and body. He told of how they prayed to their many gods, never knowing of the one true God. Pamphil, too, took fire. The brothers were in accord. They decided that above all things, they desired to go and preach and teach in this land, on the opposite side of the world. In a letter to his parents, Damien wrote, Monsignor, the bishop, will soon return to his mission, and I think will take one of us with him. Wouldn't you be happy if it were to be me? With this in mind, Damien studied harder than ever. His overworked eyes troubled him. He was now wearing thick lens glasses, but he ignored this, as from boyhood he had ignored any obstacle in a path he had chosen. His brother, Pamphil, was now ordained a priest, and said his first mass, which all the de Wooster family attended. Damien, having finished his studies at the Picpus Street House in Paris, went back to Louvain to continue his training. Every possible minute was given to his work, for he was not only covering the regular theology courses, but of his own volition, had added many elective courses at the university. There seemed no limit to the desire and ability to work possessed by the good, big Damien. September 1863 arrived. In the United States, the Civil War was raging, and the President was preparing to call for 300,000 more volunteers. Mexico, which had hoped to become a monarchy with a king of its own, was suddenly overrun by the French army, which seized the capital. But these momentous affairs, if they were known at all by the de Wooster family and their friends, made little impression on their minds and hearts. Something far more important was taking place. On the 19th of September, they all traveled to the cathedral at Malines, where Damien received minor orders. Now at 23, he was really on his chosen path. The very walls of Louvain seemed to exude tension and excitement. Hopeful questioning was in the hearts of all the young priests. Will I be chosen? Will it be I? Even the dry leaves fallen to the ground seemed to stir inquiringly as the young men walked on their way to the studies. And the wind, rifling through the leaves, gave the answer, perhaps. It was known that six priests and six Sacred Heart nuns were to be sent to the island kingdom where the need was so great. Time seemed endless before the names of those selected appeared. Father Pamphio was one of them. Unselfishly happy, for his brother's good fortune, Damien would have been more than human if he had not felt a slight twinge. Naturally, he would not have denied his brother the privilege and joy, but he himself did so long to go. However, he pitched in with all his might to help Pamphil get ready for the journey. Father Pamphil had hardly enough time for even his small preparations. An epidemic of typhoid had struck Louvain, and the young priest was too busy with the sick to give much thought to his own needs. The days before departure grew fewer and fewer, and suddenly Father Pamphil himself fell victim to the disease. Damien, what shall I do? he moaned. All my life, from earliest boyhood, I have longed to be a missionary. And now, when the gift is so near my hands, it is taken away again. I know I must accept God's will, but it is hard. Big Damien bowed his head, sharing the other's grief. This opportunity, this wonderful opportunity, and I cannot seize it, Pamphil went on. Oh, Damien, this is indeed a cross. Damien tried to console his brother, whose suffering he truly understood. Then an idea came to him, an inspiration. Perhaps he would be permitted to go in his brother's place. Nonsense, he scolded himself. You are not ordained yet, and the vicar apostolic wants priests. But wouldn't it be worth a try? A voice seemed to whisper. Arrangements are all made, and the fares are all paid, and it would be a pity if only five sailed instead of six. Would Pamphil be sad or resentful? Before the thought could really form itself, Damien cast it out. His brother's great, his only, desire was to have the word of God brought to the islands. Hesitatingly, Damien offered Pamphil his idea of substituting one de Wooster brother for the other. 
Weakly, the sick priest nodded agreement and approval. As Damien hurried from the infirmary, he turned the matter over in his mind. He would go at once to his superior. No, perhaps that might not be wise. The superior might well have other plans for him. Instead, he would write his plea to the superior general in Paris. Yes, that was the thing to do. He seized his pen and began the letter, pausing once in a while to marshal the facts in orderly array, then rushing along as he put into words his own personal reasons for making the request. Although he tried to keep his emotions under control, the fire of his missionary spirit flamed through every line. Then came a time of waiting and wondering, of rising and falling hopes. Surely, surely his request must be granted. But why should it? Ordained priests were wanted, and he was not yet ordained. But it would be too bad if only five missionaries went where six had been promised. True, but there were several other priests ready and anxious to go. Oh, but Father Pamphio was so disappointed when illness debarred him from going. What joy it would give him if his brother were allowed to replace him. But why should he, Damien, an unimportant student, think that he could replace Pamphio? It was when he was at dinner that Father Caprice, his superior, entered the refectory. His face was stern, almost angry. As he went over to Damien and laid an open letter on the table before him. What presumption! he said coldly, to wish to leave so soon for the missions. Submissive to authority, though he was, Damien hardly heard his superior's words. His eager eyes were drinking in the message that his mind hardly dared accept. His request had been granted. He, not yet an ordained priest, was to be allowed to go to the South Seas with the mission band. He was so excited, so overjoyed, that without thinking, without waiting for the meal to be finished, and Grace said, he jumped up from the table and ran full tilt to the infirmary to tell Pamphile the news. His very hair seemed electric with the joy that overwhelmed him. He, big Damien, whose schooling had been so broken, who was not yet ordained. Damien, who had kept his guardian angel so active, was going to be a missionary. The first thing for him to do was to go to his family in Nind for a farewell. It was not likely that, once having left to go to the other side of the world, he would return to see them again. The neat brick farmhouse had not changed much, either outside or in. The children were scattered, but love still warmed and faith still blessed it. Damien went from room to room, impressing each dear spot on his mind. He walked over the hillside where he attended sheep, and smiled in recollection of his first attempt at being a hermit. How easy sainthood had seemed in those far-off days. His thoughts went to his mother, whose early lessons of piety and devotion had turned his mind along these lines. His dear mother, trying so hard to be brave about parting. She realized that her son was blessed in this call from God, but her heart found it hard to let Joseph, her baby, go off into unknown danger and hardship. End of chapter 4 Recording by Maria Therese